Welcome to International Securities Exchange's podcast series. Facilitated by renowned educators, ISE podcasts are intended to teach beginning as well as seasoned investors the ins and outs of trading. To find an updated list of podcasts, please visit www.isc.com slash podcasts. Please be sure to listen to our important message following this episode regarding the risks of investing in exchange-traded options. And the other, I guess, principal actors, if you want to define global rebalancing this way, you have what's called the periphery countries, the emerging market countries of the world, the, and then you have the center, and the center of the U.S. is primarily at Europe, center being the deep capital markets. And although it's, it's changing, and it will change, obviously, as the emerging markets continue to grow and develop their own capital markets, the problem still is that these emerging markets um, are dependent on the center capital markets, U.S., Eurozone, to move money liquidity out to them, which is happening in a very big way, and that's part of this whole dollar devaluation that we're seeing, um, the money created by the Fed, money created by the Bank of England, uh, European Central Bank, um, and Japan to a lesser degree, Bank of Japan, um, very low yield in those countries, very low growth rates, so investors take all that liquidity being created by the central banks um, and also from, on the fiscal policy side, think of taking that money and moving it out to growth and yield so that money is created in the center and goes out to the periphery. And, of course, now the concern is major bubbles in the emerging market area because there's so much money being created here to try and stimulate uh, local demand in the industrialized countries, but so much of it is leaking out into the emerging market world. And, of course, the emerging market world if you, if you double back to our boy China, it has to compete against China. So all these countries that are similar to China with export models have to compete about China. But the problem is China has a fixed or pegged currency, so to speak. Um, it's supposed to crawl and it's supposed to move uh, against the basket, but basically we know it, it's been fixed against the U.S. dollar. So therefore, these periphery countries, um, ex-China, that are getting this money flow, are having their FX, their FX rates pushed up when China is not. China is basically equal. Now, I say that even though the Chinese have allowed their currency to appreciate pretty fast over the last three or four weeks. It's up about 2.3%, which isn't, which isn't anything to, sh- you know, to sneeze at. But on a relative basis, because all this money going into the emerging market is pushing their currencies up relative to China, and they have to compete with China on trade exports to the West, Obviously, this is creating these currency tensions that we're seeing um, all across the world and and in the headlines, and it comes right back to global rebalancing. The interesting thing is the fact that the market, as I said, the credit crunch was a signal that this rebalancing should start taking place, but instead of uh, allowing the rebalancing to take place, the governments of the world are doing all they can uh, to keep this game alive because it seems to be the only way to keep any type of growth in the world, meaning the emerging markets, China, the major driver of, of demand in the world, um, you know, is predicated on this whole imbalance problem. But the fact is, the market said the imbalance problem, the additional leverage being thrown into the market, um, and the lack of you know, core wealth staying within the U.S., um, was the problem. So what, oddly, um, we're, we're kind of back in the same boat. And if you look at the, if you look at the, as I said, the poster children here, you look at China and the U.S., the global imbalances have gotten worse since the credit crunch. How, that, how we measure that is if you look year on year through July 2010, U.S., um, the portion of the U.S. trade surplus China's trade surplus going to the U.S. represented 172% of its global trade surplus. Prior to that, the previous high was 144%. So, in fact, um, it's gotten worse on a, from the U.S. and the China standpoint, and they're the two key players here. If you look at the key surplus players in the world, as we just talked about in a different form, China, Germany, Japan, and the emerging bloc, um, countries. These, these countries all are export-dominated players. They need to export in order to drive the growth that they've had in the past. These are the major key consu- consumers or deficit players in the world. 
The problem is these guys now want to do some exporting, and they want these guys to start doing a lot more importing, and that's, that's really the basis of global imbalancing. Um, the touchstone or the linchpin, obviously, again, is China and the U.S. So the fact of the matter is everybody can't export, especially in a world where global demand um, continues to be, you know, I, I guess, fair. You know, it's pretty bad. Low at best, I guess, slightly growing, but nowhere near when the bottom dropped out and the credit crunch as global demand come around. Um, so you can't have areas like the U.S. and the Eurozone with their consumers in big trouble, Eurozone area, ex-Germany going into major austerity, which means they're going to consume less. The U.S. obviously, as we know, have, hasn't rebounded whatsoever, so they're not taking the goods um, that they did in the past. So this is creating the tensions. This is creating huge global tensions in the world. China's become more belligerent of late. We've seen some movements on that and I'll get to, I'll, by China. And I'll get to that in a second, but um, re, you know, up until recently, very belligerent on the currency front. One of the things I don't show in this in this presentation, and, and it's a reality for China, is if they were to have some type of one-off massive appreciation in the currency, 30, 40, 50 percent, um, they are right to say it would be a major dislocation for them. Um, which is interesting because for many years they said the currency didn't matter, but all of a sudden now the currency does matter uh, in a world in which demand isn't out there. They realize that the currency does matter, and it's mattered all along. But to get back to the point, if they were having a major revaluation, they would see that as what happened to Japan in 1986 through 1989. Um, Japan, the Japanese currency went through a major revaluation effectively through the, what was called the Plaza Accord where the major governments of the world got together to push down the value of the dollar effect, which was the, was the main theme, but implicitly it was, to, it, it was to push up the value of the Japanese yen because Japan was blowing and going and was China at the time, um, major credit capital, uh, major world power from capital standpoint, buying everything around the world huge bubble in the stock market, huge bubble in real estate, and as the currency started to uh, move higher, um, the Plaza Accord led to some other dislocations. We had the 1987 stock market crash, and that took, the, again, once again, the U.S. consumer out of the market for a little while. Um, back in 1987, when we had the stock market crash, we saw a slight improvement in the U.S. current account deficit at the time. And just that minor improvement in the U.S. current account deficit was enough to take demand away from, from Japan at a time when they were, um, their currency was being tightened and they were in a major bubble, very, very much like China today. Thank you for listening to our podcast. To find more podcasts on options, stocks, alternative markets, and market data, please visit www.isc.com slash podcasts.